Hello, welcome to Sonography Radiology Training Channel. This series of videos is about placental imaging. This is the second video in this video series with title of Abnormal Placental Shape and Thickness. The outline of this presentation include abnormal placental shape, including bilobed placenta, sexanturiate lobe, circumvlati placenta, placenta membranacea, ring-shaped placenta and placenta finestrata, placental mesenchymal dysplasia, abnormal placental thickness, including placentomegaly and thin placenta and final teaching points. At first, abnormal placental shape. Placenta with an accessory lobe is called a sexanturiate placenta. At ultrasound, the accessory lobe is usually smaller than the main placenta. However, occasionally the accessory lobe is equal in size to the main lobe, which is termed a bilobed placenta. Placentals may form as separate disc of nearly equal size. It's also known as placenta duplex, found in less than 4% of pregnancies. The cord inserts between the two placental lobes, either into a connecting chorionic bridge or into intervening membranes. Sonographic detection of a bilobed placenta that a chorionic bridge that is a normal placental tissue connecting the two lobes is not likely, particularly if not specifically searched for it. This ultrasound image shows a bilobe placenta. The two lobes of placenta are separated by a thin bridge of placental tissue that covers the internal os. In this case, the umbilical cord inserts into the bridge of tissue. Bilobe placenta usually of no clinical significance. However, if placental lobes are separated by intervening membranes and the cord inserts directly into these membranes such that the cord insertion is filamentous, then sonographic detection may help to avoid a cord avulsion at delivery. Sexanturiate lobe A sexanturiate lobe is an accessory placental lobe that develops away from the main placental disc. The umbilical cord inserts into the main body of the placenta and the prominent vessels may be visible coursing along the intervening membranes. If an accessory placental lobe is suspected, color doppler sonography may be particularly helpful in identifying the location and path of these vessels. In this 20-week gestation, the umbilical cord inserts at the main body of the placenta, which is implanted anteriorly. Occasionally, the vessels that connect the main body of the placenta to a sexanturiate lobe overlie the cervix, which is a form of vasa previa. This color doppler sonography shows vessels connecting the main portion of the placenta to the posterior sexanturiate lobe. In this situation, there is the risk of rupture of the vessels connecting the lobes during labor, which may lead to fetal death. Clinically, an accessory lobe may be retained in the uterus after delivery and cause postpartum uterine autony and hemorrhage. This transabdominal transverse scan 9 days postpartum shows retained placental tissue seen as an echogenic mass. Also, we can find a low resistant blood follow in one side of the echogenic mass. Saxenturiate lobe is encountered more frequently with in vitro fertilization and twin gestations. This study showed that saxenturiate lobes of placenta were more common in twin pregnancies compared with singleton pregnancies. However, the presence of abnormally shaped placenta does not seem to affect prenatal outcomes in twin pregnancies. A saxenturiate lobe should be differentiated from a single placenta that extends to two quadrants of the uterine cavity. Like this sonographic image shows placenta at fondal anterior position. 
Note should be taken that a myometrial contraction can simulate a succentuate lobe, and therefore repeat ultrasound can be done to differentiate such a lobe from a focal contraction. In this ultrasound image, the main placenta can be seen anteriorly, and a structure similar to the placenta can be seen also. But after about 15 minutes, that structure disappears and shows that it was a focal contraction. Circumvelati placenta. In a circumvelati placenta, the chorionic membranes do not insert at the edge of the placenta but at some distance inward from the margins, resulting in a ruled out and thickened placental edge and also a central depression. They are usually benign condition requiring no alteration of management and simply have to be differentiated from other type of bands and membranes in the uterine cavity. This variant may be complete, including the entire placental circumference or partial. When the placental ring is flat or lacks the central depression, it's called a circummarginate placenta. Regardless of whether it's benign, circumvelati placenta is reported to have an increased risk of chronic placental abruption, preterm delivery, small for gestational age status, chronic lung disease in the child, and neonatal intensive care admissions. At ultrasound, the raised edge of the placenta is depicted as a linear bond or shelf-like structure isoechoic to the placenta tissue. It protrudes toward the amniotic cavity with its base at the placental edge and not attached to any fetal parts. This photograph shows the double back fold in the membranes at their attachment near the margins of the placental fetal surface. These images were taken from the fetus.net website which were presented by Professor Felipe Genti. All of these images belongs to a fetus and the different views that the circumvelati placenta may be seen. Another case and different views of circumvelati placenta and another case in this form. At three-dimensional ultrasound, it has been described as analogous to a tire mounted on a wheel that is the tire sign. This three-dimensional surface rendering of the placenta showing a circumferential depression with a thick peripheral ring on the chorion plate providing the appearance of a tire mounted on a wheel. Potential mimics of a placental shelf at ultrasound include uterine synechia, amniotic bones, septate uterus, and old subchorionic hematoma. Uterine synechia may originate from any point of the uterine cavity and may have blood follow. Amniotic bones are thin avascular structure originating from any point of the amniotic surface, either related or unrelated to the placental surface. They may be attached to the fetal parts and can cause fetal abnormalities such as limb amputation. Septate uterus is usually recognizable by its fundal position. Old subchorionic hematoma lacks the free margin of the shelf. Placenta membrancia. With placenta membrancia, all or nearly all of the membranes are covered with villi. Sonographic examination demonstrates a placenta that is covering most or entire the uterine wall. These images also were taken from the fetus.net website, which presented by Professor Felipe Genti. We can see a placenta membrancia at first trimester, early second trimester, late second trimester, and third trimester. This condition is often associated with placenta accreta, increta, or precreta, and vasa previa. These pregnancies are complicated by recurrent 
antepartum hemorrhage, second trimester miscarriage, preterm delivery, fetal growth restriction, and fetal demise. Delivery is often complicated with postpartum hemorrhage and placental retention. In several cases, it was necessary to perform a hysterectomy immediately postpartum. Ring shade placenta and placenta finestrata. With ring shade placenta, the placenta is annular and a partial or a complete ring of placental tissue is present. With placenta finestrata, the central portion of a placenta disc is missing, but these rare variants are not typically visible sonographically. Placental mesenchymal dysplasia Placental mesenchymal dysplasia is a rare placental vascular abnormality characterized by aneurysmal dilation and congestion of chronic vessels and cystic or hydropic villi. On ultrasound, the placenta is enlarged and can contain cystic or grape-like component, and therefore it can resemble partial molar pregnancy on imaging. However, unlike a partial mole, a viable fetus can coexist with dysplasia. One third of the cases are associated with biquid Wiedemann syndrome. Additional reported findings in a phenotypically normal fetus include FGR, preterm delivery, intrauterine fetal demise, and neonatal death. Commonly, the maternal serum alpha fetoprotein levels are elevated. In 9% of reported cases, associated maternal gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, and HALP syndrome has been observed. Differential diagnosis includes partial molar pregnancy in a two-in gestation with a viable fetus, chorioangioma, subchorionic or periplacental hemorrhage. The final definitive diagnosis requires pathological evaluation of the placental tissue often after delivery of the viable fetus. Abnormal placental thickness as I explained in video 1, as a general rule, the placental thickness in millimeters roughly approximate the gestational age in weeks. The Collins reference believe that it doesn't normally exceed 4 cm in a second trimester or 6 cm in a third trimester, but many articles believe that it should not exceed 4 cm. Anyway, a placenta with a thickness of more than 4 cm should be considered placentomegaly unless it's proven otherwise. Accurate measurements should be done in the mid portion of the placenta near the umbilical cord insertion, in cases of central or near central cord insertion, and must be measured perpendicular to the uterine wall from the subplacental veins to the amniotic fluid while excluding the myometrium. A thickened placenta has been described in association with torch infections, gestational diabetes and fetal hydrops. This anterior placenta measured about 7 cm at 28 weeks gestation. The fetus was hydropic in the setting of trisomy 21. As I explained before, a thickened placenta with cyst can be seen in partial molar pregnancy, triploidy, in placental mesenchymal dysplasia. In some cases, placentomegaly may result from collection of blood or fibrin within the placenta, as we can see here fibrin deposition in the placenta. Examples include massive pervilus fibrin deposition, intervilus or subcardiac thrombosis, and large retroplacental hematomas. In this ultrasound image, the placental thickness measures about 4.6 cm at 20 weeks gestation. Oligohydraminus was also present and the maternal serum alpha fetoprotein level exceed 18 mOm. Pathologic examination following delivery confirmed a large intervilus thrombus. Placental abruption can be falsely interpreted as a thick placenta when a retroplacental hematoma is isoechoic to the placenta at ultrasound. 
Placentomegaly is associated with a high risk of placental insufficiency. A thick jelly-like placenta which vibrates with abdominal pressure is associated with a 60 to 75 increased risk of IUGR. This ultrasound image shows thick heterogeneous jelly-like appearance of the placenta at the different gestational age. Here 18 weeks. 20, 22, and 32 weeks gestation. A careful fetal growth assessment is required once a thickened placenta is identified on prenatal sonography. Thin placenta. A placenta is not generally considered too thin, although focal attenuation may occur if a hematoma develops and subsequently resolves. A small placenta associated with a growth-restricted fetus may also appear thinner. As you can see in this ultrasound image, we have pregnancy-induced hypertension and a thin placenta at 24 weeks of gestation. A pregnancy with severe polyhydraminous may appear to have a thin placenta as a function of compression by fluid. This ultrasound image at 30 weeks gestation with polyhydraminous showed a thin placenta with a thickness measurement of 1.5 cm. Now, please pay attention to these final teaching points. When there is a sexon curiate placenta or accessory rope in the lower part of the uterus, careful evaluation with ultrasound for wassa previa and velamentous cord insertion should be performed. Bilo placenta usually has no clinical significance. However, if placental lobes are separated by intervening membranes and the cord inserts directly into these membranes, then sonographic detection may help to avoid cord avulsion at delivery. Circumvelati placenta is usually blind condition requiring no alteration of management and simply have to be differentiated from other type of bands and membranes in the uterine cavity. The pregnancies with placenta membrancia may complicated by recurrent antepartum hemorrhage, second trimester miscarriage, preterm delivery, IUGR, and fetal demise. Delivery is often complicated with postpartum hemorrhage and placental retention. In several cases, it was necessary to perform a hysterectomy immediately postpartum. One third of placental mesenchymal dysplasia cases are associated with biquid vitamin syndrome. Additional reported findings in a phenotypically normal fetus include IUGR, preterm delivery, intrauterine fetal demise, and neonatal death. In some cases, placentomegaly may result from collection of blood or fibrin within the placenta. Examples include massive previlous fibrin deposition, intervillous or subchorionic thrombosis, and large retroprecental hematomas. A careful fetal growth assessment is required once a thickened placenta is identified on prenatal sonography. A small placenta associated with a growth-restricted fetus may also appear thinner. Now, I suggest two others of my videos that are close to this video in terms of matter. And thank you for your attention.